the Coach Rob Podcast. Answering questions and eliminating frustrations about health, wellness, and performance since 1987. Welcome to the Coach Rob Podcast, the People's Podcast, episode number 60. This one's going to be good, Coach Rob. Difference between being fit and being healthy and fit. How you doing, bud? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks again for uh, carving some time out for our listeners. I'm, I'm really excited about this podcast. I think there's just a, a plethora of misinformation that's out there. And I think a lot of our listeners want to be healthy. And then when they start to get some momentum going, maybe their feet get kicked out from underneath them or they get run down or even possibly get injured. So a lot of questions on this subject. So I thought we'd do a, let's take a deep dive into the difference between just being, you know, maintaining versus actually being fit based on a good foundation. So we'll, we'll make sure everybody clearly understands what we're talking about after today. Yep, definitely. First off, I want to thank all of our listeners on YouTube, all of our viewers on YouTube. Um, if you guys please uh, hit the like and subscribe, that definitely helps us out and make sure uh, that'll make sure you get uh, all of our videos and, and podcasts as well. If you guys are listening on uh, iPhone, Android, thank you for, uh, for downloading our, our show and, and listening to us on a biweekly basis here. Absolutely. Greatly appreciate it and continue to send us in any questions. Uh, as you said, Dan, we like to refer to this as the people's podcast, uh, really addressing the plethora of misinformation that's floating around out there. So thank you for yeah. everybody who's taken up, given up some of their time to listen to this, this pod. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's get into it, Coach Rob. Uh, being fit and being healthy and fit, it's two totally different fitness levels, right? I mean, you got people that, that eat healthy and they think that they're fit, but maybe they're really not fit. But then you got the people that are, that are fit and healthy and they're working out and they're eating right. So there's two different buckets of people here. And, um, you know, th those two buckets are new individuals that are maybe new to fitness and then experienced uh, individuals that have been working out, you know, their whole lives and explain the two differences of these, of these folks. I want the term rhetorical to come to people's mind. How many people that are new to fitness, new to health and wellness, they'll put certain individuals that maybe they see on TV or they drive by a local gym and they see all these hyper buff people. They, the people that are new to fitness, look at those hyper buff people and go, oh, that's the epitome of fitness. That's the epitome, epitome of healthy. Well, being in the business that I've been in at the time of this recording, 38 years, I cannot tell you how many people we see on a monthly basis that are essentially falling out of that umbrella or that, that network of people that consider themselves healthy because they've run themselves into the ground. How and why would they run themselves into the ground? How many times have we spoken in previous podcasts together? The foundation of health and wellness starts with eating, sleeping, hydrating, and then when we look at all of the elements of life known as stress, I think that's when we have to step into the, cross the threshold of the front door to the fitness and go, do I have a foundation to go work on my athleticism? Athleticism, as we spoke about in the last podcast, could simply be walking around the block. That, I mean, that's athleticism, good job. Remember what you and I said, if you work out 10 minutes a day by walking around your block when you get home from work, and you do that over six days, there's an hour's worth of walking that you didn't do last week. And I think we have a tendency to go from zero to 100. And I want to go back to like you're saying on these two different types of individuals, because anybody that's new to health and wellness, and they want to venture into athleticism, what they do is they put people on a pedestal and they go, oh, that is the benchmark of health and wellness. No, my experience has been they tend to be some of the most unhealthy people that you'll ever see. Go to a triathlon, go to a marathon, go to these CrossFit games. How, much, how many times, and, and I'm just using some very generic, I'm just trying to think of things off the top of my head. When you go to those events, Dan, how many times do you see people taped up? How many times do you see those bands around their knees? How many times do you see those sleeves over the joints? That's gotta be a first indicator that there's a problem. When you look at young individuals and they have dark circles under their eyes, 
deep wrinkles, that's a sign of oxidative stress, brittle hair. Have you ever seen the athletes that look like they're leatherback turtles? Their skin looks really dry and wore out. That's a sign of unhealthiness, but yet if you and I were to go to, I'm just going to use a running race for an example, Dan, you and I go to a road race, right? And somebody crosses the finish line first, but then you get up close to them and you go, okay, the person was fast. They won the race, but they're 25, 26 years old. They look like they've been punched in the face by Mike Tyson. Their skin looks like a leatherback turtle. Their hair is real brittle. They get a cut. They don't heal very, uh, very quickly. You start getting to know them a little bit better. They have problems sleeping. Oh, but they're fast. Do you see? That's what I wanted to kind of, for the, at the very beginning of this conversation to set the tone. That's why I call it rhetorical because somebody who may be new to health and wellness puts people on a pedestal because they're quick in their sport. They're efficient. They're, they're considered one of the best in the sport does not mean that they're healthy. And then once the person becomes unhealthy, what do they do? they fall back to the foundation of getting healthy. I don't know if the listeners will be aware of this or not, but if you ever get diagnosed with Epstein-Barr, when you get your blood work or if you've gotten some blood work, go and see if they've evaluated EBV. That's going to be the acronym, Epstein-Barr virus. If you get diagnosed with the Epstein-Barr virus, Dan, guess what the doctor is going to tell you? You need to reduce stress, eat more, and sleep more. Do you see why I say it's rhetorical? Because people will work to be fast. They work to be the best in what they want athletically. And then they push it to a point where they become unhealthy. They crash and burn and they come right back to the foundation of, I've got to eat enough. I've got to get enough sleep, quality and quantity. I've got to balance stress. And what did the doctor tell you? Everything that you and I have been saying on the podcast, you can't take on more stress without offsetting it with adequate amount of food and sleep. As simplistic as it is, it's literally, there's your closed circuit. So we just sit in this rhetorical, just endless loop that we never seem to be able to break, but it is so easy to break because if we don't allow ourselves to become that hamster on a wheel by understanding what is the true definition of healthy, now there's no end to what you can do. And I want to use the word athletic, athletically very loosely. Let's just kind of keep it in a category of being fit. Now, fit could be you're making a living as an athlete, or fit could be you're a soccer mom of three that you know look, feels and looks good on a dress on in a dress on date night on Saturday night. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense to the listeners as we get this podcast started. I want to bring it back to the the, the individuals that are new to fitness, and yeah. uh, we talk about doing too much at one time. Would you relate that to you know, people, they see these people outside the gym, they're all ripped and they're like, man, I just got to go in there and just, I got to work out and I got to do all these uh, power lifting and I got to do the, the treadmill for two hours. Do you think that these people, the, the reason that they do that is because they're looking for instant results, like instant self-gratification of working out? Um, do you think that mental, you know, the, the mentality of that is what these people have? I think it's a mixture of, it's a great question. And it, it, I think it's going to be a mixture of where the individual is at versus where they want to be with one caveat, their background. So we, being in the triathlon world as deep as we are, you'll see a lot of people that will, they'll be all American swimmers in college, get absolutely burnt out, going to the gym, doing dry land, doing two a days sometimes swimming, you know, four to five hours a day, when they finally end up, let's say they get their, themselves all the way to the Olympics. When they're done with the Olympics, the idea of being in the gym or being in the pool again, they're absolutely not the least bit interested in that. Here's, this is why I want to say your historical background has to be part of it. When you've gone through the young years of swimming into college and then into the Olympics. And I know that's a very big extreme. Not many people have been to the Olympics, but if I've teased about this with you and you and I have been working out and spending time together, the older we get, the better we were. Well, when I make a comment like that, how many times do we think back to when we were young and we didn't really think much about, you, know, you just get up in the morning and you just, you just got after it. 
we didn't stop to think about foam rolling because we weren't really tight, it didn't really bother us. When we look at, we have to warm up a little bit longer because we're older, we got to get the collagen, we got to get the synovial fluid moving in the joints. It, this is where your answer is going to come, is in our brain, we're like, I remember when I didn't have to spend that extra 10 or 15 minutes getting the joints lubricated, getting the synovial fluid moving, getting kind of the aches and the pains. From that standpoint, I do believe it becomes, all right, I remember when I was young and I was very fit, and then we kind of lo lose touch of that and we want to get that back. Well, then you have some people, my wife, Michaela, is a perfect example. She grew up in an artistic family. Her dad's a professional painter and a teacher. She grew up as a professional painter, played the piano. Her brother was the athlete in the family. So when Michaela started getting into triathlons and running, as we always say, speaking with her, ignorance was bliss, right? She would go to work all day. She'd get out of work. It's no big deal for her to go run five, six, sometimes 10 miles after work, go home and be Raya's mom and then go to bed and get right back up. To your point and to your, the illustration with Michaela, she would only sleep five and a half, six hours. She'd work eight, nine, maybe 10 hour days like most of us do, but she still would go run. Why? Because ignorance is bliss. She'd just go get it. So when somebody goes to the gym, I think what happens is they go to the gym looking for wise counsel and you and I have spoken about this in previous podcasts. What you don't want is somebody that you look to for direction that doesn't have the insight to go, you know what? We don't need to put you on the treadmill and have you run at a super high rate of speed. What we need to do is low intensity, do more functional work. And here's why. And this, it always, I'm going to even go so far as to say it cracks me up. I don't know why when we go into the strength arena, trainers feel that if I can make you so sore that you can't brush your teeth tomorrow and you're literally miserable, then somehow you're going to feel like you got your money's worth by hiring me as a personal trainer at the gym. Do you see the irony in all that? And I think that's, I think that's kind of where I was going uh, yeah. is the people when they leave the gym, they've done all this stuff. They leave sore or they, they wake up the next morning, they're sore. They think, oh man, yeah, I, 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 I killed it at the gym yesterday. I'm, you know, I'm sore. So that must be, it must be a good thing. Yeah. Well, and here's the irony of it. Think about it. And I want our listeners to put them, take our subject and you kind of, you have to play illustration ping pong with us. You have to go to both sides of the table. Unfortunately, the trainer realizes that if they can't justify you spending the money on their services. So for example, the listeners to the show, if you go to the gym and you're not sore, are you still going to continue to go? Probably not because you feel like you didn't get your money's worth. The trainer's thinking if I make him or her so sore, they're going to feel like they got their money's worth. Now I need you to go up another platform. You do this for a couple months and you get tired of always being sore and miserable. So how long do you keep doing it? If we were to look at how many people walk into the front door of a gym in January, February, March and April. I'm sure there's statistics that are out there. How quickly does, do those numbers fall off? So if you're a trainer thinking and you're in the month of April, looking back at January, how unintelligent was it to smash the people? Because now in April, you have 90% less clients walking in the door. But for the people that were hiring the trainer, if they didn't get that smashed feeling, they felt like they weren't getting their money's worth. So what's the net result? We have more and more people that don't enjoy fitness. They don't do fitness. And then when we get to March and April, what do they say? Oh, just another year, gone to heck in a handbasket. I'm just destined to be fat. Now, I will say for the sake of the listeners, I have been terminated on our elite performance side of things. I have been terminated when I get hired. I do a needs assessment. I do some baseline assessments. And I realize the athlete probably doesn't need more speed work. They need more aerobic and we get into flexibility and some other things. I've literally been terminated because people say, I hired you to kind of bust my chops. And because you're not pushing me, I'm going to go another direction. And I say, look, I understand that. But let's look at these biofeedback variables. Have an understanding as to why I'm not going to ask you to do high intensity interval or lift extremely heavy, because your body is literally not there. 
And ironically, that's the conversation that we're having today. With you don't have a foundation to go to the gym and do speed work and heavy lifting. Not, not my opinion. You look great in the mirror. You feel good. But what you don't realize is your body is redlining. Dan, you and I have talked about this in our very first show together. This is why I started Complete Med Solutions as a company, because the blood is literally the blueprint of your health. It's the blood work that comes back. You and I can't influence that with opinions. It's a range of numbers that comes back after an, after an analysis. Now, everybody that's listening to this pod, stop and think. If we take a sample of your blood today, your sample of blood is giving us a snapshot of what you've eaten and all of the stress you've been exposed to, all the food, the water, the exercise, relationship issues, financial issues. In this podcast, we're talking about athleticism. Your blood work is a snapshot of your ability to handle stress. So now, now when somebody joins us, I don't immediately have the, you know, like I could prick their finger and then do a, do a blood evaluation, but I do encourage all of our clients to get their blood work done so that I can educate them on why we're training. Maybe we're only doing eight hours a week and somebody else is doing 13. Maybe Dan, you hire me and we do five hours a week and we do it 95% aerobic, 5% anaerobic because of the profile that we built on you. Take away the guesswork, always make a, an exercise program, maybe even an ultimately a high-end performance program. You don't just do it in a spray and pray format. You get baseline assessment numbers. You figure out the health of the individual, which is what we're talking about today. And if I can get a blueprint of your health and I can see where your current capabilities are at, when you come in and you tell me that you just want to lose 25 pounds after having a second baby, maybe you've put on that freshman 15, whatever the it may be. That's the information that I start with to get you from where you're at to where you want to be. When you mention somebody driving by and going to the gym, is it psychosomatic that they want to look like them? Maybe, maybe not. Because as I always say to my clients, always use your high school fighting weight as kind of your benchmark. If you were 185 in high school and right now you weigh 250, I've had people that have come to me and say, yeah, I want to get down to 150. And I'm like, well, what were you in high school? And they're like, well, I was 185. Well, let's get, let's get close to that zip code first. You see the paradigm shift? Yeah. That's what becomes important is, I, and I say this to my clients as well, please every day just try to jump across the sidewalk. Please don't try to jump across the, can the Grand Canyon. Because what you're doing is you're literally setting yourself up for failure. And I know that's an extreme example, but it does help the brain get an idea if every day, five minutes out, five minutes back, you do that six days a week, you've got an hour, but that's where that little negative canary gets on our shoulder based on what somebody said, could have been a dad, a mom, a partner, and we kind of dismiss, we've talked about this on the show, those little crass comments are just like you being a wooden post and someone puts a nail in, sure, they can pull that nail out, but that hole's still there. And then we get into the psychological aspects of health and wellness not even talking about fitness and performance. So, so say, definitely a mindset. say a new individual decided to go to the gym and, and I'm just hypothetically speaking, because sure. I'm sure that there's some, some listeners and viewers out there that are watching this and that are, that are probably feeling a little bit motivated to, to do something and to go to the gym and, and, and start, you know, get, get on a path to being healthy and fit. Yeah. If you go to the gym and you come out the next day and you're sore, right? That's probably an indication you did too much. How would an individual know that you're in that window of, of getting a workout, but not overdoing it? Yeah, there, there's a lot of meat on the bone to what you just said there. Think about the rule of 48. What you do on Monday, you're going to feel it a little bit on Tuesday, but you're going to really feel it on that second day. So what we always say is your, your uh, soreness levels, they should be noticeable the next day but they should be starting to wane a little bit, not get to the point that they're so bad. I always use the analogy, and you've heard me say it even on today's pod, you're so sore that you can't brush your teeth. You're so sore that you can't squat down to use the toilet. Please don't take that as a distasteful illustration, but yes, you should feel like you did a little bit of work. But Dan, 
if you don't mind, I'm going to digress for just a moment. Mm -hmm. If you were doing some speed work or you were doing a heavy lift session, my question to you is, why are you doing that? I'm not saying it's a wrong thing to do, but where does that heavy lift session fit into what you're trying to accomplish over the next 10 to 12 weeks? See, that's where, and, and I, I want our listeners to really change their perspective one degree. Get to a point where you enjoy exercise because people think unless I've got a lot of soreness, it wasn't productive. That's not true. Because if I can get, if you've listened to us for any period of time, if I can change that perspective one degree and let your focus be on, remember the acronym, Dan, that we use, KISS, keep it simple and sustainable. I want people to look forward to going to the gym. Our body was designed to move. Our body was designed to adapt to stress. Unfortunately, what we see is that the stress levels are too high. So just because you can do a bicep curl with a lot of weight doesn't mean that you need to, unless you tell me that you're training for a bodybuilding contest. You see the difference there? If you're gonna tell me that your goal requires lifting heavy, Okay, I can understand that. Now let's talk about how we build a six week block. So you that week one, you do testing. Three weeks, you adapt the body, the muscles physically and mentally. The body will adapt to that new stress and then the muscles will actually become stale. So if you say to me, I have to lift heavy because of something that you're doing athletically or like I've got a client that's leaving for Utah this weekend and he's going to go race. He's going to go do moguls and he's a very good skier. Well, we've been doing things specific to the demands of doing black diamond moguls, right? Super steep, super fast, lots of directional changes, but we don't train like that for 12 months out of the year. You see the difference? So if somebody, if you're asking how, how much is too much, if your residual soreness on day two continues to go up, you cross that line a little bit too much. Now, something that's not quite so obvious, and here's, before I give the illustrations, I want people to think about the way that we rationalize. If you wake up in the morning, and we just talked about being excessively sore, and then normally for breakfast, you are ready to eat, and all of a sudden your appetite is suppressed. All of a sudden you start getting a scratchy throat, if you wear the heart rate monitors, we're a big, a big fan of the whole Garmin platform. If you wake up in the morning and your heart rate's elevated, there's a sign that you've done too much. But Dan, here's something that I want the listeners to also contemplate. Is it that you did too much or did you not get enough food and sleep to absorb what you did yesterday? I'm, I'm going to kind of defend a lot of the personal trainers that are out there. They do get a bad rap for pushing the, the individuals too far. But if the, if the trainer is saying to you and they go through some, you know, some legitimate ways to calculate your calorie burn rate, we use the Garmin so that we're not guessing, we're not using generic formulas. We, we use what we call active and resting calories. Once I know what you're doing, let's say you're going to walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes, you're going to work for eight hours a day, and you're going to be your children's parent. If I get enough documentation, say for six to eight weeks, I know what your calorie burn rate is on average. Now I can reverse engineer how many calories you need to take in. Now stop and think about this. Are you telling me that the trainer is overworking you or are you going to take responsibility if you've been educated on how many calories you need to take in and yet you choose not to eat the calories? Is that really the trainer's fault? Think about your typical massage therapist or chiropractor, any doctor, Dan, if you jacked your shoulder up and you go to physical therapy and that physical therapist says, I need you to do these things when you get home, you know, put a bag of uh, peas on your shoulder for ice. And then I need you to do 15 to 20 TheraBand internal and external rotation. And you say, okay, I'm going to go do that. And then you come back tomorrow or two days later and the physical therapist says, Dan, did you do it? And you say no, but yet your shoulder's getting more and more frozen up because of the lack of movement because you didn't do the therapy. Do you see how frustrating that is for the physical therapist? Well, it, it, it really ahead. comes down to, to self accountability, right? And, and we talk about the foundation of health and there's some, there's some bullet points there that uh, we're going to talk about, but one that is not coach Rob on the list that maybe should be number one is to have the ability to be self accountable. 
right? I will agree and I'll disagree with you. And I love how you bring that up so people know that we don't just can our whole conversation here. I think it's it's kind of the chicken and the egg because I think anyone who's listening to our pod, I think they are taking, they're at least interested in being responsible. And then when they go to seek professional advice, what happens? You get, if you ask five people, how many different opinions do you get? Five different ways on how to drop body fat, how to build muscle, how to do this, how to do that. And that comes back to your point, Dan, accountability and responsibility Ultimately, it's all on us. But if you're being fed the wrong information, I think most of our listeners know, I went through a really nasty divorce. My divorce lasted over five years. Now, if I were to go through another divorce, I know what to expect. I know what questions to ask. And again, I don't mean to bring up a sour subject, but I I have to use illustrations like that because it, it gets the point across quicker. The listeners don't know what to ask because they don't know what to ask. So then when they decide that they want to become fit and they're looking for a way to start pursuing it, they don't know where to start. So then what do we all go to? We go to the proverbial Google God that is essentially the epicenter of contradiction. You can go to Google and you could look up a subject and immediately you're going to get this side and this side. It'll automatically contradict itself. So I do agree with you, Dan. Um, I hope people understand the way you and I jib with each other. You know, it is about accountability and responsibility. And that's why the genesis for this podcast and our partnership together is how many people are out there idealizing, quote unquote, people who look fit, but are internally an absolute mess. And then when people do decide to commit to some level of activity, they go too far too soon under the supervision and guidance of somebody who's really pushing and promoting an agenda, whether that's not eating enough calories sleep deprivation, over hydrating, as we've talked about, you know, when you go to a gym and it says drink a gallon of water and then people are walking around, you know, flushing out their electrolytes and wonder why they feel sick yeah. to their stomach. And those are all the foundations of health, right? We've, we've talked about those, making sure that you're eating enough food, uh, making sure you're getting enough rest, the quality and the quantity um, and staying hydrated. I mean, those are the, the three really core foundations of, of health but then you also have your balanced stress levels, your your blood work, your you know, make sure your hormones are all intact there. Exactly. That's where if I can get everybody who's listening, please don't jump across the sidewalk and immediately want to jump into athleticism and high end performance. Always recognize that the three foundational components is going to be quality and quantity of food, quality and quantity of sleep, proper hydration levels. And then if you put those together, Dan, you just hit the big F word that's so important. The ability to focus, I don't care if it's focusing in a staff meeting, if it's focusing in an operating room, if it's focusing in an athletic environment, we all want to jump to, we want to be focused, right? We want to not have to be relying on uh, a stimulant, you know, because we've got the old dreaded head nod 15, 20 minutes after we get to the office. So if you, for those of you that are taking notes or watching us here on YouTube, if you If you stop and you think about kind of an ebb and flow, most people's ebb and flow is upside down. And what I mean by that is we're frustrated because we can't mentally focus on our job. We can't stay in a coherent conversation with somebody because we're like squirrel. You know, the word focused is the end result that we all desire because focus allows you, again, let's start with fitness. Focused allows you to be your kid's parent. Focused allows you to be your parents, your partner's partner. Uh, Your ability to focus if we go into athleticism and then ultimately into performance, you want to be excelling in a sport specific environment. Well, if you have stable, excuse me, if you have low blood sugar, you have unstabilized blood sugar. If you're dehydrated, if you're running on four hours of sleep, you're never going to get to focused because the foundation isn't there. And if you do this day over day, month over month, year over year, we end up seeing ourselves give up because we don't realize that we're jumping to focused without any foundation. We're jumping to athleticism. We're we're jumping to dominating some level of the, the staff meeting. We want to be the best employee or the best employer, but we're not coming in with a foundation. That's where we start finding ourselves hitting alternative ways to keep ourselves going. If you don't mind, I want to go prevalent. 
Go ahead. In the, you know, just to recap what you just said, it's very prevalent in the motocross industry, right? Where, yeah. you know, we have to be able to go uh, run 20 minute motos, right? But yet we haven't ridden in a while. We haven't done 20 minute motos. There's no way that we're going to expect ourselves to go out and run a 20 minute moto. It just is not going to happen because you don't have the foundation there to do it. Well, and, and do it, that's where the word sustainability comes in. How many times have you seen guys, they can run a smoke, they can put a heater down, you know, they can run a two minute lap time. But then when you try to string five of those together, it goes two, 203, 206, 215, 220. And what's the risk of injury when we start getting in that 215, 220? Yeah. Almost 100%. Because we know the faster you go, the easier it is to go fast on a motorcycle. Ironically, it's applicable to all sports. It is much easier biomechanically to run faster than run slow. It's just having the strength and the muscular endurance and the capacity to be able to sustain it. And that's the big, the big frustration that I see with people is they want to go from zero to 100, not because they're being irresponsible or trying to bite off more than they can chew. They don't, there, there's really no established benchmarks. That's why I always say, that's why I go back to the Garmin, wear the Garmin, build some information, build a profile about yourself, and then I can help you. Um, you mentioned the Moto community, so I'll, I'll keep in that same sandbox here. I'll have people that will hit me up and ask, hey, can you put together a nutrition and hydration program for me for Loretta's? I could take your 500 bucks. I, it wouldn't be very, you know, it wouldn't be very ethical. And here's why. I don't know what your calorie burn rate is. I don't know what your perspiration and sweat rate is. I don't know what sensitivities you may have to different types of foods. So yeah, I could, I've got five books that are on Amazon. They're, they're smoothie books, they're dinner books, they're snack books. I only put those books together because people said, Hey, give me some ideas, but whether or not, you know, our blueberry blast smoothie is going to really work for you is depending on your sensitivities to the ingredients that go in it. Every item that's in there, Sure, you in a textbook test, you could say is a healthy item, but what if you have a negative reaction to it? I've shared this with our listeners before. I have a client, if he eats an apple, his face balloons, he just has a huge allergic reaction to apples. Now, I've never seen anyone in my 38 years that's been allergic to apples except him, but he's that one out of 38 years. So it doesn't matter what I think about apples and how good they are, antioxidants, good source of fiber, high in vitamins and minerals for him. It doesn't work. And that's what well, I want our listeners to think about as well. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, you see some of these nutritional, you know, diet plans, right. And, yeah. and a lot of them, like I've, I've seen some in the past for myself that I just don't, I thought I don't like, I don't like the food on there. Yeah. Right. But if I know what my calorie burn rate is, I know how many calories I need to intake. I can personalize that for myself and eat what I like to eat based off of that. Not, not, you know, what is somebody's telling me that I should be eating? Yeah. But you just used a word that 99.9% .9 of our listeners aren't comfortable with. You mean I'm supposed to like the food that I'm eating? You mean I'm supposed to like the exercise that I'm doing? And, and again, I don't want to sound like I'm living in a, you know, in a glass house. This is how we have built the foundation of our business. I always am going to start with quantification of numbers and then reverse engineer from there, whether it's building lean muscle mass and dropping body fat, wanting to feel and look a little bit better in certain clothes on date night, or being an athlete at the very top of the world. It, the, for, the way that we get there is exactly the same. It is all based on the only thing that changes. I'm just going to cut straight to the chase. The only difference between the way that I treat a soccer mom of three that wants to lose 20 pounds to somebody that wants to be number one in the world in their sport is the person that wants to be number one in their sport, usually all they have to do is eat, sleep, and train. And yet I've got a soccer mom, Dan, look at yourself. I, I'll use you since you, you know the listeners know who you are. Look at what you get done on a Monday morning by 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I've said this to, on several podcasts before and I say it with my clients all the time. Somebody who has a family, you've got a young daughter, you've got a beautiful wife, you actually have three different companies that you own and run of, you, of your own, okay? Well, you're trying to find 31 minutes in an entire 24 hours to maybe get some strength training in. 
maybe you've got 45 minutes to do cardio. Just depends what day and what's going on in your family. I'm dealing with an elite athlete that gets paid to do nothing but wake up, eat, sleep, train, compete, repeat, and gets paid a lot of money to do it. The difference is for, we go back to what we said at the beginning of this webinar, when, excuse me, this podcast, when you stop and you think about stress, every one of our listeners that are not a paid professional, they deal with more stress on a 24 hour basis than these athletes. Now you go, wait a second, Rob, you're going to tell me that my, my life, I'm going to put you back in the catbird seat, Dan. Dan is talking to Rob and says, you're going to tell me that I'm dealing with more stress than somebody who makes $100 million a year. And I'm telling you, yes. Now, the difference is they might have to perform on a Saturday night in front of a crowd. They might have to do it on TV. Yeah, that's pretty stressful. But I, I want the listeners to think about this example. Depending on when you're listening to this podcast, think about what you've done today, or if it's early in the morning, think about what you've done yesterday. Think about what you've done in the last seven days. I want you to take somebody that's 20 years old, fresh out of college, and I want you to drop them into your lifestyle. Be your partner's partner, be your children's dad, be your employee, be your employer, be the athlete, balance your checkbook, get the groceries, get the car fixed. Look at all these things that you do on a daily basis. And what we don't realize is we've almost become desensitized to how much we do that it just becomes our new norm. And Dan, you just said it. I think you hit the ball out of the park, bases loaded. Heaven forbid we like our job. Heaven forbid we like our partner. We like the way we look in a bathing suit, the food that we eat, the exercise that we like. We all desire to be better parents, better partners, be fit for ourselves first, because if we're not fit for ourselves, we're not really worthy for anybody else. I Unfortunately, I've, I've had clients that have reached out to me and said, Rob, I'm a multimillionaire. These are people who did it in the business world, right? And the saddest comment that I've ever heard was, I'm wealthy at the expense of my health, and I'm afraid I'm not going to live long enough to see my grandkids. Have you, and I've not have heard that, that once. Meme? I've heard that a lot. Have you seen that meme floating around? This is a little off topic, but I saw it floating around on the internet the last couple of days of a guy that says, I'll give you $10 million today, but you won't wake up tomorrow. Mm. would you take the $10 million? Yeah, and everybody, question. of course, would say no. Yep. Because, you know, they want to wake up the next day. So money is money is really not the most valuable thing in the world. It's it's your health and it's it's your time that you have here. And, and that's, I think you hit well, it, right? You got to be able well, to take the time to make sure that you're healthy. While you're bringing up like Instagram photos, anybody that follows me on Instagram at Coach Rob Beams, I put a post up a couple of years ago and it says, if you don't take the time for your health now, you'll have to make the time for your illness later. If you don't take the time for your health now, you'll have to make the time for your illness later. And that's always really resonated with me because, and, and again, we could throw out all kinds of textbook cliches, but I love this one as well. If you're living a hard life, then you're doing it right. If you're living an easy life, you're doing it wrong. And you can apply that to finances, health, wellness, whatever category that's important to you. And it, it's the same thing though, Dan, it's we wait and I, it, it, I'm just gonna be blunt. I'm gonna sound like I'm on my soapbox here, but this is where I, I'm so thankful for YouTube and these various pod, podcast outlets because I just believe if we can get in front of a million people whether it's me talking to you on this on this podcast and a listener is a parent of one or two children or has a pretty strong network, maybe coaches a baseball team and could get in front of a group of parents and their and their young athletes. Why do we and, and we've talked about this before, for those of you that are with us here on YouTube, on your piece of paper on the very far left, put down the word cell. Next to the word cell is tissue and next to tissue becomes an organ, and a series of organs makes up your system, our entire body of systems. Cells, tissue, organs, system. Why is it as a human, as a human species that we are supposed to be the smartest species on earth, that we wait until we're diseased 
before we decide to do something. And I don't want to get into the political realm of the government, health insurance, the medical system. They wait till it's broken, then they want to try to fix it where we would rather be proactive and, and not let it get broken. I'm not interested in going there. We're talking to our podcast listeners one-on-one. -on -one. Your influence, people in your immediate family and the people that you can influence on a baseball field, soccer field, motocross track, whatever. Why do we wait until we get injured to then say, hey, maybe there's some credibility to creating an accord or striking an accord between strength and flexibility? How about not allowing ourselves to have a suppressed immune system before we start to realize the importance of food and sleep to truly rejuvenate and rebuild our bodies from the inside out? Anybody that's in the motor world that may be listening to this podcast, you watch your odometer. What does that odometer tell you? Sure, it tells you how far you've gone, right? What do all of us moto heads, how do we look at our numbers? It's time to rebuild the motor. It's time to rebuild this. It's time to reset that. Maybe it's time to sell it all together. As the old saying goes, right, Dan, very rarely do we sell something because it's working so well. We sell something because it's pretty tired and ready to move on. Yeah. But yet when I go on a soapbox telling people that they're not eating or sleeping enough, it brings our conversation full circle because they say, well, I hired you to smash me. I'm like, well, the problem is, is you don't have a foundation. You're underfed. You're underhydrated. You definitely aren't sleeping enough. How do I know that? Here's your blood work. You've got 23 variables that are out of range. How do I know that your hormones are messed up? You have no sex drive. You're craving simple sugars. You have night sweats. You can't sleep through the night and you're in your thirties. Heck I'm 55. I don't have any of those problems, but it, I, I'm not putting myself on a soap on, on a pedestal here. It's the idea that I want other people. I'm 55 years old. I don't want somebody. And I, again, you have to put yourself in my position when I'm twice the age of somebody and they can't get an erection and they can't get through the night without having night sweats. There's, an, there's a huge problem there, but we yep. wait until we have the dysfunction. We have night sweats and we go, hey, maybe we need to do something. Well, that's the red light in the corner going adrenal fatigue, adrenal fatigue. So what do we do? We make excuses for it. I've got night sweats because I'm premenopausal. I can't get an erection because I'm not 22 anymore. You, you know, you can't go to sleep because you can't turn your brain off. People have heard me say this numerous times. What I want you to now step back and ask yourself is, and I like the word you said earlier, Dan, heaven forbid, we like our partner, we like our job, we like exercising, we like the food that we eat, we have a better understanding of why we're doing it, and then we find ourselves not having to rely on caffeine, nicotine, any of these other lift-me-up type of stimulants. Yeah. Think about that. I want to recap. Uh, actually, I have, I have one question uh, before yes, I want to recap this because we're running short on time. But yeah. um, for somebody that's wanting to, to get started here, a, a good practice would be to go get some blood work done. So you have a, a, a foundation on where to start. How many times per year should you have your blood evaluated and your horm hormones evaluated? Well, selfishly for me, I like to have my athletes do it once a quarter. Um, because if you think about it, we've only gone 12 to 13 weeks. So if something is in out of alignment, at least we can try to address it. Then you make some adjustments to your nutritional habits, your sleep habits, and your exercise habits. And then when you get that blood work done, we're only 12 to 13 weeks in. If it's going the right direction, we keep doing what we're doing. If it's not going the right direction, we continue to make some adjustments. Keep, keep trying to do that as much as you can. I will tell you, I absolutely... I'm scared to death of needles. That's why I don't have a tattoo on me whatsoever. The idea of a needle going into me, it's bad enough just donating blood or getting my blood work drawn. But to me, it's, it's a pain worth going through because it allows me to stay in front of ever getting run down, ever having any, you know, nobody that's listening to this podcast enjoys being sick or run down or unhealthy. So if you get that blood work done, if you're willing to put in the work with your food and your sleep and your exercise, it's the simplest and most accurate way for you to make sure that what you're doing is actually going in the right direction. So, but again, Dan, I don't want to idealize it. Heck, if somebody get it to me once a year, I'd be thankful. Once a quarter would be ideal anywhere in between the middle because people travel and have other obligations. But if I'm the listener to the podcast 
and I want to be healthy and I want to ultimately be able to move into some level of athleticism and maybe high end performance, understand that you'll never reach your potential without it. Now, that's not a sales pitch for our complete med solutions. If you can find a doctor that can get the blood red, is going to look at it from an athletic, a true health and wellness and ultimately an athletic platform, please do it and do it often. If you're finding that, like, for example, when we when we receive your order, we get the script, we get the blood work back and you meet with our medical team. And that's done in 14 days. Time is money. Money is time. And it is not a sales pitch as much as it is the whole genesis behind me. Even starting this company was because I hear people, it takes them six months to even get in to see their doctor or they end up having to pay out of pocket to get a full panel done, hormonal, saliva, cortisol. Now they have to pay out of pocket because the medical or the insurance company doesn't deem it necessary. So guess what? Their attempt, our listeners attempt to be proactive ends up physically costing them. I, I saw one athlete had $1,600 cash bill for a full panel of blood work because it wasn't approved by the insurance company. And these kinds of things like Daniel and I talk about off the record, I'm not someone that likes to complain. Let's find a solution to people's frustration. That's why the whole genesis of this podcast. And can yep. you believe the number that we're on, by the way? I know, it's crazy. Uh, <laughs> where, where can our viewers and listeners uh, get some more information on uh, Complete Med Solutions? Yep, for right now, um, we're looking, we're in the final stages of the website itself. So that just to streamline it, feel free to reach out to us. Just go to coachrob.com. All of our contact information is there. And like I say, uh, depending on when you're listening to this recording, our goal is to have complete med solutions up here uh, within the next two weeks. Uh, there's just a few things that we had to work with on the backside. So, uh, but no, thanks for asking on that. And we want to make sure that it becomes available uh, for everybody. Perfect. All right, man. It's been another good one. I, I, I look forward to these, uh, these shows uh, on a biweekly basis. Next week, we'll have our uh, performance podcast. We're a little bit off sync this week. I was actually feeling under the weather last week, so we're a little behind. But next week, we'll have our performance podcast out. I want to thank all of our listeners again on YouTube and, um, and all of our podcast apps. Coach Rob, I'll see you next week. Thank you week. so much. And um, to every one of the listeners, thank you for your support. Thank you for spreading the word. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me and my team directly. You can reach us at contact at coachrob.com. We're definitely here to answer your questions. And by the way, you don't have to be a paying client. Send me your questions. We're here to get the misinformation broken apart. So thank you for your time. Dan, we'll see you soon, buddy. Peace. See you. See everybody.